And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is David Cobb, television producer, director, and writer for almost 30 years, who worked as vice president, head of production for Paramount, Universal, Sony, and A&E Network. David has had multiple near-death experiences, which we're going to learn about today. David, thanks for joining me and welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right, David, if you don't mind, let's just start on the day that your first one happened and go from there. Sure. There's a little bit of a a lead into it. Um, I had gone for a couple of years um, and had been getting very sick and, and had a blood infection that no one could figure out what was going on. I was losing weight and, and losing my immunity and such. And we had moved to Arizona and had lived there for about a year, year and a half. And I was struggling with this, as I said, a blood infection. And on New Year's Eve, uh, 11 years ago, I woke up right at midnight and standing at the foot of my bed was about a nine foot tall, just being of light, I- incredibly intense and, and bright. And I had spent my life uh, being indoctrinated with the other side before I had been visited by people that had died and things like that. But I didn't really pay that much attention to it. I didn't really want to be a part of that world, not to be rude, but I just, I thought people were a little bit, you know, so I had a grandfather that came to me when he died, those types of things. And I just took him as, okay. So this being is standing at the foot of my bed. And I just thought, well, thank God I got high ceilings. I mean, I really (laughs) did not react to it at all. Um, and so I said, what do you want? And I looked over my wife was asleep. And uh, he said, I just want to let you know that I will be returning shortly. And I will have things to teach you and to help you. And I said, well, okay. And boom, he vanished. I didn't really think anything of it. And about four hours later, I woke up. And I had never been that sick in my entire life. And I started to throw up and everything. And just for the next 10 days was so ill, I thought I was actually going to die. That's how it felt. Went to the doctor, went to the hospital, nothing. Again, no one could figure it out. At about the 11th day, one o'clock in the morning, I woke up and there was that being standing at the foot of my bed again. And I said, no, 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 no. (laughs) Last time you came, you made me so sick. I said, I don't know what you want or doing. I want nothing to do with you. Go away. He didn't move. Didn't even blink. He just stretched his hand out. And I shook my head. I said, no, I'm not. I forget it. And quickly, I realized he wasn't going to go away. And so as I reached and touched his hand, immediately, we started to fly. And we took off. And we went to my property. I have a ranch in northern Arizona. And you know how time is in in that essence. You don't realize how long it takes. But we were like planes where we suddenly just kind of came and in a fast walk stopped into the section of my ranch. And as he, he was walking ahead of me, and as he was walking ahead of me, he was picking out these black shards out of the ground, almost like spikes. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, these are remnants from people in previous civilizations that have been left in the earth, and they must be removed so that we can cleanse this part of the earth and we can make it a a sacred place again. I said, okay, but what are we doing? (laughs) And he said, well, I'll show you. And I said, well, okay, but who are you? And he said, you can call me father. And I, and I stopped in my tracks and I thought, father, you know, my, my father has passed away. I said, but that's not him on this lifetime. And my brain thought, well, maybe it's a father from a previous lifetime, but it's all happening so fast that you don't really have time to take it all in. And so I followed him and we walked up. And as we came over this ridge on my property, there were 12 other ancient spirits around this huge campfire. And we walked over to it and he started to tell me about some of my past lives and tell me things that were going on, basically started to teach me. And then he turned to me and said, I'm going to every night give you a chapter of a book that I want you to write. And he started to give me the first chapter. After I went through that period of of sort of download, I woke up and I ran downstairs to the kitchen table and I just started to write word for word what he'd given me. 
And every night for the next 12 nights, a total of 13 nights, he appeared. We would travel up to the property. He would teach me different things. And he would give me a section of this book that I was supposed to transcribe. Now, on the third night, as I was doing this, <clears throat> he stopped me and he said, look, we're, uh, we kind of didn't figure this out right. We're making you sicker than we thought. By transferring this information and writing this book, there's a frequency to the knowledge. And that frequency was higher than my body could actually handle. And it was killing me. And they said, so we're going to have to do it in a different fashion. Instead of speaking this, this chapter to you, we're going to give you this egg. And it looked like a huge Easter egg. And on the top of it had this crack to it. And this incredible bright light was sticking out of it. And when they put it in my hands, it opened up like a flower and the words just started to tumble into my brain. And so what they would do then the previous, uh, the next eight nights is at the end of their teachings to me, they would just hand me the egg. I would go back, I would wake up and I would see the egg in my hand and immediately I could write down everything. And they said that would have less impact on my body and what was going on by doing it in that manner. On the seventh night, when I appeared, and I thought it was just normal, every night we come for some teachings and for some of the uh, the book, all of the rest of the elders were up and around, and they were forming in a separate circle. And he said, tonight is your night of rights. And I said, rights for what? And he said, well, we, we don't have a word for it. And I said, well, you have to have something. You, you must, you know, what is it? He said, well, <clears throat> Consider it as being a teacher of teachers. I said, okay. He said, now, <clears throat> what we're going to do is we want you to accept these things. I'm going to ask you some questions. And you agree to them, then we'll continue on. And that's how the ceremony is going to go. He said, we're going to give you this square of Mother Earth in which you overlook and you make medicine for all plants, animals, and people alike. He said, do you agree? I said, okay. I mean, you're in this dying experience. <laughs> I'd been in the hospital twice in that 13 days. My wife didn't know what to do. She was panicking. And you're just not, I mean, I kept saying yes, because what am I going to do? So he said, fine. He said, so now you're going to take all these plants that we teach you to make medicine with, and you're going to protect them. And I said, what plants? He said, we'll teach you. I said, well, what I medicine, I don't know how to make medicine. He said, we will teach you. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. And so we went back and forth of him giving me these things that I was supposed to accept as responsibility and whether or not I would agree to them. To the point where at the end of it, he said, and now from this point forward, the rest of the ceremony is completely in secrecy and you agree to that, correct? And I said, yes. And then I blacked out for 45 minutes and didn't come till till the end didn't come to. When I woke up, I don't remember any of the secret section of it, but the introduction I remember in terms of taking of the rights. They had also said that they were going to do, um, they wanted me to create a foundation that created these healing centers all over the world, where we could teach people what plants we should protect and how we combine them with honey and other things to create these natural medicines. <clears throat> Which, okay. Didn't make any sense to me, but all right. So for really the last 11 years, that's been my pilgrimage, is learning all of these plants, how to protect them, how to grow them, how to compound them, and how to make natural medicine. We now make over 100 natural remedies. Uh, we grow our own bees, and we grow our own plants. So at the end of the 13th day, father turned to me and he said, look, for me to come down to this level and communicate with you and to do these things with you, he said, is a very rare occurrence. He said, I will not be doing it again. You cannot communicate with me again. You cannot reach me ever again. You have the other 12 elders. You can ask them. They will help you with every, they will continue to teach you and help you grow. And at that point, and I know this is common with people with near-death experiences, the the love that I felt for him, the love that I felt for the world, and the impact of him saying that he was not going to come back again, I burst out crying. I could not stop. I was so upset for two or three days, and I had no explanation of why. 
And I didn't feel that intensity of connection to him when he was teaching me those first 12 days. It wasn't until he said that he was leaving that it sort of all came crashing down on me. A couple of the, the, the most interesting things that happened to me, especially the night of rights, were one of the elders came up from the circle and walked over to me and he tore off a piece of his garment, of his top, and he handed it to me and he told me to sew it into my top. And when I looked down for the first time, I realized that I was wearing sort of a deerskin clothing, much like they were. And of course, as I looked down, suddenly a needle and thread appeared in my hand and I went and I sewed that parcel into my own coat. And I turned to father and I said, what is this? And he said, this is the ceremony. And I said, yeah, I get it. But what am I doing? Why? What do you call this? And he said, again, we don't have words or names for this. He said, but it has been called the tearing of the cloth or the exchange of the cloth. And it wasn't until about a year later in meeting with some of the elders in another dream that they explained to me that that's how I was becoming one of them. I was being initiated into their group. And by one of the elders giving me his piece of clothing, he was making me one of them. One of the others is that he had turned to me and he said, and now you accept all of these things. We now give you your name. Your name is Konawaka. And I, and he said, repeat it. And I thought it was very strange because he's, you know, he's like this far from my face. He said, repeat it. I said, okay, Konawaka. And he shook his head. He said, Konawaka. And I said, I get it, Konawaka. And he, his eyes lit up and he grabbed my mouth and he said, say it, Konawaka. And I said, really? And he said, yes, say it again. And I said, Konawak. He said, that's correct. And then he moved on. Again, through you know my history of being in education and certainly um, with entertainment and, and researching so many past civilizations and religions and such, the cluck at the end of the name to me stuck out so much because so many people uh, claim to be shamans and these healers, and they've been giving these names like, you know, running dog, whatever nonsense it may be. And I was so afraid of being one of those that when I realized that only a couple of years later that what he had given me was a true name in a true ceremony, that I start to accept some of the things that even had happened to me by it being such an ancient tradition of word not just a normal word, but a word that had a sound and a vowel to it in that way, it seemed so much more authentic to me. So at the as he was leaving and claiming he's never coming back, he did a great thing. He said, oh, by the way, um, you know where we were making you sick and giving you the information to write the book? He said, it got so bad that we only gave you half of the chapters. He said, you, you weren't able to physically take all of the information we wanted to give you. So we're going to give you a little bit of time off. And then you'll have to do the 13 days again for the second half of each of the chapters. And, you know, I, I just, what are you going to say at that point? It's, I was so entrenched in, in him leaving and, and the, all the emotions that were accepting. I just went, yeah, okay, fine. So the next day I woke up, I could feel there was a shift. I started to heal. I started to feel better. I could eat. I could drink. Again, lasted about 10 days. And sure enough, it started up again. But it didn't start with him coming to me. I just knew that I had to wake up in the middle of the night, travel to the ranch. The elders were there. They handed me the egg again. They gave me the second half of the chapters. But then they gave me more teachings and more things. They told me a preface. They gave me petroglyphs that I had to put on the chapter headings of each of the book. And they explained to me the petroglyphs that they gave me, these new original drawings, that someone could look at the image and capture all of the information in the chapter through the image. They explained to me that petroglyphs in ancient tradition weren't so much histrionics. They weren't writings on the wall to show that, yes, we killed deer and yes, we lived in tents. It was actually, they put symbols together that expressed knowledge and wisdom. And if you stared at that petroglyph, you could take the information in. 
So I got through all of it. And at the end of, say, a couple of months, um, I was able to record all of it. And I knew that I had to publish it. But when I would go back and try to rewrite it, because I would read a paragraph and say, well, you know, that's a little bit unclear. Maybe I can clean it up. I would start to get sick. And I thought, what is this? And sure enough, a couple of nights later, I had a dream with one of the elders and he explained to me, look, we write ancient wisdom in very simplified form for a reason. It's because it's ever changing. And depending upon where you are when you read it, depends upon the message that you take from it. So if you specify that paragraph into a singular meeting, you take the power away from it. It being simplified allows it to be multidimensional. And so I couldn't change a single word in that first book that I wrote. Couldn't go near it. And they told me, because I had questioned them many different times. I said, look, did, have you looked at me? I'm a white guy. <laughs> why are you giving me these ancient native wisdom? Why, why am I indoctrinated into your tribe? Two things. One, they said, is because I had purchased this land on sacred ground. And for me to be a steward of it, because you don't own Mother Earth, I had to become of one, one of them. But two, they knew my past. They knew what I had done for a living. They knew that I was a writer. They knew that I, but they also knew that I had a certain success and that I would be accepted if I presented this information this way. They said, we had to find someone that the world would accept. And they said, because Native Americans aren't accepted. You can have all the wisdom in the world as a Native American and people just look the other way. Only when you're a normal person like us do people start to consider what you say might be of some value. So that was the first big block. And it took me almost a year to be completely healed from that, those experiences and from that combination of those two near-death experiences. Um, it happened three times, four times really, um, over the course of the next 10 years. Each time it was a combination of meeting the elders, getting new teachings, and a clearing of what happened in the past. I would have people from my past that I had obviously unresolved issues with that would come to me as I was dying again, and we would work out the past. We would finish what wasn't finished. And it was explained to me that only in that way can you elevate yourself to actually accept information on a higher level. <clears throat> the ancients consider human bodies to be rental cars. They joke about it in that way, and they made me write it that way. I said, look, it's a rental car. You use it, you abuse it, whatever it is, but when it's done, you cast it aside. It has nothing to do with who you are as a soul. It doesn't affect you. You don't live or die because of it. I said, but the one thing, just like rental car agreements, because they're this long and you never read them, is that there's a small piece of information at the bottom of your rental car, of your rental agreement for your body, that says that any time that you do not advance spiritually on the planet, you no longer have the right to this car, to this rental body. That the whole contract of having a body on earth is to learn and to advance spiritually. And when you stop doing it, you no longer have the right to be here. David, thank you for sharing those experiences. Do you feel that the light being or father was an ascended master or possibly Jesus as a Native American or God as a Native American? Well, the, the Native Americans view the creator as father. That is how they refer to him. So it is their God entity, as you describe it, you bet, without a thing. And, and I think that's the thing that really, I don't want to say bothered me, but made me not tell anyone what happened it, it's too magnanimous it's just too, too big for me to say that i talked to god and these are the things that he told me i just wasn't willing to go out in public and say those things yeah but yes absolutely of course it was when you started writing the book was it like what some people call automatic writing where you didn't even have to think you would just put your pen to paper and words would just come out no, there was still a translation. I, I could see the words in my head, but I was transcribing it. So automatic writing is you have no consciousness of what you're writing. Mm -hmm. I knew that I was writing. It's as if I was transcribing. I could see the words in my head. I could see the sentences, and then I would write them on the paper. Mm -hmm. And then I guess after they 
decided not to download it into you. You would just kind of imagine the egg cracking open and then you would see the words kind of the same Correct. way. Correct. And it's, it's kind of a guided meditation. Interesting. Something that I'd been taught in my mm -hmm. early teens, um, you know, TM and those things were available in the seventies. Whereas if you can go to a space where you can clear your mind and have no thought, then you can have communication. And that's the space that I would go to. It would be a, a sort of a deep meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, when they had said that they wanted me to find all of these plants, create all of this medicine, and start to help the world with it, um, I really had absolutely no idea. I had a black thumb. I mean, I couldn't grow a weed. There, there's no way. And out of nowhere, I started to have the dreams, because it's a continuum, of the medicines to make. I walked into a natural of health store about a year later. And I said, look, I have these five remedies. And I made the first five remedies, one for immunity, one for breathing, one for allergies. Based on we got our own bees, we started growing our own honey, and we started growing our own plants, and we put them together into a compound. And I said, I have this natural medicine. And the owner of the store says, well, you know, I don't really believe in that stuff. But I have a big cotillion of people that do. So yeah, I'll buy your stuff, put it right there next to the cash register. And a week later, we were selling in three stores. Hmm. And then a couple of practitioners heard about us, acupuncturists, a neuropath, and then even an MD contacted us. And within two years, we had nine practitioners that were prescribing our medicine. And we went from five remedies to 10 to 20 to 30 to 50 and now to 100. Because the doctors and the practitioners would come back to me and say, what about a kidney infection? What about a liver infection? What about, and I would then a week or two later have a dream with the elders and they would teach me what herbs to grow and how to compound them and how to make them. And so for us, it was an ongoing, almost 10 year journey of learning how to find the right herbs to protect, how to make them into medicine, and then being able to get them to the people and then getting the feedback of them actually being cured by it. That was the other thing is that, I couldn't go out in the world and say, look, I've made this great medicine. Everybody started taking it. I didn't do the research. I didn't buy the companies, you know, to go out and do all of the experiments. So we ended up, that's what the doctor's purpose was, is they started prescribing them and started getting the information. So suddenly we were healing 2,000 people a year with natural medicine and getting the feedback of how the medicine was working and whether or not it, it, the compounds were correct. Now, you mentioned that you were going to the hospital during these days. Did you ever go through any period of doubt, like what's really going on with the visitations and the, you know, and why I'm getting sick versus the medical reason of being in the hospital? Of course. And it did. And I started, I became allergic to all Western medicine. And that's how we found it in the hospital is that they said, well, we believe you have a blood infection. So we're going to give you some antibiotics. And that was the first time I completely left the body in the hospital, whereas they injected me. And within two minutes, I rashed up and I was up out looking down. And after that instance, I just said, you know, I have to sort of back off of Western medicine because it doesn't seem to be working with me at all. But I, I still didn't believe that what they said to me was really happening in a certain way. Do you know? I, I still thought I could still be normal. I still thought I could take some aspirin. I could do... I can't even take aspirin. Last time I took aspirin, I had internal bleeding. They mentioned to you that you are one of them. Yes. Do you think you can describe to us or tell us a little bit more about what they mean as one of them and who they are? <clears throat> That's a very interesting question. Um, from what I saw and what it is, is that there was a group of 12 el elders, and it's as if it's a council of ancient Native American spirits that overlook North America and protect it. And by them giving me a square to protect, and it's a square of Arizona. If you take the map, I could show you the square in which they gave to me. Um, not only am I to make medicine for plants, animal, and people, not only am I to protect the medicine, but energetically, I'm supposed to be responsible for Mother Earth's balance in that square. And 
one of the exercises that I do with the elders is that we go to an elevated place, a thousand feet, 2000 feet, what you would say above the earth. And we balance the energy of that section of mother earth. We hold it in our field and we bring it back into balance. So part of the main duties of this elder council is maintaining mother earth and its health, both energetically and also physically. Do you believe in synchronicities? Synchronicities? Yeah. And what I mean by that is this. I literally recorded a podcast yesterday and a woman had a near-death experience and she said Jesus appeared to her in the near-death experience as a Native American. <laughs> and and this kind of stuff happens all the time and i as you know i just give dates i don't like schedule i didn't even you know yep. i don't know yep. i don't know the details of anything basically and here we are the next day native american as god that's what i'm saying it's like it's very fascinating for me without a doubt like i i had spoken um to david sitch who's a um near-death experience researcher. He's, he's interviewed more than 700 people. I was flashing on YouTube, which I never watch. I saw him. I had a hit to call him the next day at 1035. And he picked up the phone. And we talked for two hours. And when I told him some of my experiences, similar to some of these, he would say, oh, oh, I had four people that had that. I had seven people that had that. Four of the things that came out that I wanted to share with you of this that I thought was most fascinating is when I told him that my edict was to go and protect these plants and to make natural medicine, he said, do you know what you're doing? Do you know how important that is? And I said, well, I think so. He said, no, 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 no. He said, I had a number of people that had alien visitations through their near-death experiences and they described earth as the library of plants hmm. that it is the only planet in all of the universe that has all of these species of plants on it and that aliens from all over the universe come to see our vegetation and that this planet is supposed to be the protector of all great plants i couldn't quite believe it right then he says, and by the way, do you know that I had a number of people with near-death experiences that big pharma is going to be exposed for making people sick on purpose? They're going to come out with the emails and the correspondences knowing they were making people sick, but it made them buy their medicine for the rest of their life, therefore, therefore giving them great profits. And that was going to be exposed to the point where it actually is going to collapse the pharmaceutical in industry, and everyone is going to turn with this huge rush to try to figure out how to make plant-based medicine. Which, again, as you know, synergy as you talk about, synchronicity, um, uh, it's an amazing thing. I will tell you one of the greatest concepts, though, uh, that Father taught me in those 13 days that he really was enamored with. One of the two nights that Father did this to me um, when I was there and he was giving me normal teachings is he put his arm on my shoulder and as he spun me around, his hand waved into the sky and all the stars were erased like he had erased a blackboard. And he said, I want to explain to you the purpose of incarnation. And he did this and this huge balloon went up in the sky and inside of the balloon were 50 small balloons. He said, for instance, that is a, a soul who has had 50 incarnations. Those 50 small balloons represent those 50 minor lifetimes. When they decide to reincarnate again, they will take three or four of their previous incarnations and combine them into a new sort of mini me. And they will incarnate on life with the remembrance, the karma, and the lessons of those four previous lifetimes, with the purpose of redefining what is left of those four lifetimes. There's still some things to learn. There's still some people to forgive, whatever it may be. And that is the purpose of the incarnation. And when that four lifetimes is refined, it returns to the larger soul and thereby refining the whole soul. 
In other words, you take a small portion of yourself, you make it better, and you bring it back into yourself. That's the purpose of incarnating on earth. He said, so when someone has a near-death experience or they have a terminal disease that they miraculously are cured, there's the one thing that is always the same, and that is they, they are never the same person afterwards. And he said, the reason is, is because once you've finished the refinement of those four lifetimes, your purpose here on life, on earth is finished. So you have to reach back to your soul and accept two or three more past lives that you bring with you to refine those. So you redefine your new purpose on life. And you also redefine who that sort of mini me is. Now you have seven lifetimes of exist of previous lifetimes existence that you remember and you're working on. When I explained that uh, to David, he, he did one of those, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> he said, I had this experience with a person, he said, who had gone to the other side and he thought it was a Jesus Christ, but it turned out being an angel. And the angel was telling him about his past lives and was explaining to him all of the things that he did right or wrong, not really condemning, but you know how it is. It's sort of, this is proper, this is not. And then just as he, if I thought he was going to tell me what my new purpose was, he said out of nowhere, he grabbed three orbs and shoved them into his chest. And he immediately remembered three past lives. Which to me was an astounding confirmation of the principles that father had taught me is that this person had died. He wanted to continue living. And so the angel said, fine, here is your new purpose for life. Did father ever mention to you that there will be an end point where we don't incarnate anymore? Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I asked him many times about looking into the future, right? Because we all want to see what it is, you know, currency collapse, whatever it is, what's going to happen? How is this going to, right? And they refused because they, they said that the only constant is that everything is changing. The only constant is that everything is in motion. They said, the only thing that we can show you as the future will be the volcanoes. And this goes into one of the other teachings of Father, where he said, basically, where we are in the universe, our solar system is here. And every 52,000 years, we travel along the inside of the universe back to that same point that we started. Every 26,000 years, we're in the same linear progression as we started, but on the opposite side of the universe. So he said... The last 2,000 years, we've been in a part of the universe that's sort of been a nook or a cranny of the universe. And all of the planets and other solar systems have not been touching us or not been affected and impacting the planet. And that higher frequency and all those energies from the other planets is what raises our consciousness. And so we ended up getting disconnected from the universe the last couple thousand years. And that's why they believe it was the dark ages for us. And that's why they believe that we've been so disconnected from the truths. Well, December 21st, 2012, as the Mayans recorded it, that is when we came back into a point of the universe where all those planets and planetary influences started to touch us again and started to force us into a raised consciousness. So what he described is that those planetary energies that we were absent of, that we're now being bombarded with, is a huge amount of new energy hitting the planet. And for the Earth to be able to transmute that energy, as in take it in and release it, the only way it can do it is through volcanoes. And so he said, watch the volcanic activity. As it starts to ramp up and as it starts to happen, you will know that you were in the throes of the change. But, and this is a long-winded answer, but to answer your question, how it comes around is these higher energies that we're being hit by from the other planetary systems forces us into a higher consciousness, forces us into a higher vibration and frequency so that we can understand ancient wisdom and higher principles. 
at the same time, it creates the people of lower understanding into going crazy. Putting 20 volts in a 10 volt battery. It, and that is the period in which we are in now that they call um, the pressure cooker. Is that the reason you're seeing this huge division of people is because half of them are waking up and saying, I accept the new energies. I accept the new thought. I accept living in a community where we look out for each other. We believe in basic laws and understandings and love. And the other half is saying, I still want to buy my Mercedes. I still want my MTV. I don't want to let go of being in control and also being a master of my universe. And it's making them crazy because they're unbalanced because of it. The higher energies is forcing them to think in a different way and they're fighting it and they don't want to have anything to do with it. So what the ancients said is happening is that we are trans transitioning into what would be heaven on earth. And that is we all raise our consciousness and start to live in a different way. And then that different way, we get rid of karma. Karma was created, the ancients said, to keep us on track. They said that people were incarnating to earth for thousands of years and not learning anything because we had free will. Free will. I want to be an asshole. I want to be a jerk. I want to use people. I want to, you die, you come back, you just keep doing it. And so they believed that there was a universal acknowledgement that people were not evolving properly. And so karma was created so that if you went off the path, if you did unbalanced things, there would be a ramification to teach you that that is not the way to become spiritually evolved. So what will leave us in the next hundred years is that karma and people will return to having free will to do anything and everything on this planet as they haven't for many thousands of years. All right, I think you've had more near-death experiences, so let's move forward in time to those. <laughs> um, as it went forward, um, what would happen to me is that I would fight what's going on. And uh, I wrote the book, I published it, but I didn't really do anything with it. I started to make medicine, and I didn't really... Um, again, make that into a business because it was not supposed to be a business. Um, I would, about three years later is the next time that it happened. Similar thing, I woke up and I had that feeling that I was going to get sick and it was really, really serious. And sure enough, it would start. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. And then it would run for that same 13 days. But this time, some of the elders would come and teach me some simple things but it was mostly about people coming and communicating with me and getting rid of past connections. You know, when I talked about father picking up negative spikes out of the planet, we have that in our ethereal body, in our energetic body. Anytime that we have an experience with someone that we can't finish, we can't get over, we can't finish, we can't understand why it happened, we don't release it. We take it and we shove it somewhere in our body. And you go, you know what? I'll come back to that. I'll talk to them in a year. I'll talk to them in a month. Uh, they'll make it up to me. We'll figure it out. But we shove that somewhere. Well, that actually starts to interpret and actually malign our energetic field. Say, so take a battery and start putting rocks in it. Well, the capacity of the battery becomes smaller and smaller. smaller. So the next three near-death experiences that I had, I would go through, I would be sick for 13 days. I would actually wall myself up in a room. Couldn't have air conditioning. I couldn't have people. I couldn't talk. I couldn't have TV. I couldn't have noise. Nothing for 13 days. And in there, the elders would teach me some more lessons about healing, about dealing with karma, those types of things. But I would have visitations from souls of people that I had I would say unresolved issues with. For instance, the last near-death experience I had was two and a half years ago. Um, I ended up with a double bleeding ulcer out of nowhere. And I lost half of the blood in my body. By the time they got me to the ER, I was, I don't even know what the number was, but 
another two hours, I would have been dead. Dead as in not coming back. As I'm there and they bring me home and I continue to, to have the visions and the near-death experience, I had two guys from Universal show up, middle of the night, just standing at the foot of my bed as souls. They look similar to what they did in person. One of them was sick and the other one's wife was sick. Now, when I had been in Universal, uh, I had a lot of trouble with this one particular, we were doing Spider-Man. And there's a lot of ego and a lot of things going on. In this particular first project with Spider-Man, these guys were both newbies. They, they had never made a film before. And they were given in charge because they were special effects guys. And they kept trying to get me off the project because they didn't like my supervision. Well, I'm kind of head of the studio. <laughs> you can't get me off. So they started to malign me. They, they told people I had made pornographic movies. I mean, they just really lost their mind in trying to, you know, usurp my power. And so when they came to me, they said, look, I'm sick, the one gentleman. And the other one said, and my wife is sick. And we both know that that happened because of what we did to you, because of the way we tried to malign you and hurt you. We have created the instant karma back against ourselves. So if you don't mind, would you, would you mind uh, forgiving us so that we could both get better? And, uh, you know, I just kind of chuckled. I said, well, boys, I, I can't really do that. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can. And I said, well, I can't. You, you've created a karma that exists within the universe. You, you want me to just say that you didn't mean it, that it didn't really happen? They said, no, 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 we just, we, we, we know that we did wrong. And so we're sorry. So if you just say it's okay, this will all go away. And I said, well, I, I can't do that anymore. And they said, well, either way, we no longer think poorly of you. We no longer are creating bad images of you. We no longer hate you and want you to die. We just want to let you know that, that we've released you of all the things that we attached to you from the past. And I said, well, I appreciate that. I said, but I, I can't say that our slate is clean because you took things from me and the universe has to pay me for those things. And if it comes from you, then that's your fault. Sorry, I, I can't let you go of that. And so it was a combination of things like that. There must have been a dozen different people that showed up from past experiences that there was a reckoning that had to happen so that my memory in my energetic body was released of all of these things so that my energetic body could operate at a higher frequency, take the rocks out of the battery so that I had more capacity. So are you saying that you finally released them or you forgave them or, or what happened? I said, I appreciate that you've released me, but I don't harbor anything against you. I'm not holding you in this. You have a debt to the universe, not to me. Okay. And I can't release you of that debt. But they wanted to make sure that I wasn't still harboring anything against them because they were harboring me. They wanted to know that I didn't still hate them and wish them bad. You know, Ill. They wanted to make sure they weren't sick because I was trying to get back at them. You know, that's something I saw in a couple of other near-death experience videos that I watched as people were explained by other entities and masters about how our thoughts and how our wishes attach to other people and the ramifications of that. Someone cuts you off in traffic and you get mad at them and say, oh, you know, you're a jerk, you're an asshole. We don't realize that we actually attach an energetic karma to them so that they attract what we think they deserve. What we really don't understand is we create more karma for ourselves by creating a negative karma for them. Every time we think of another person in a negative way, we create a negative attachment to ourselves also. So the evolution for us is that we are supposed to live without casting negativity on everything. That is the change, is that we stop judging even in our minds. The ancients were very specific about saying, anything you think is what you create. Anything that you think you create. And those have to be the point. You have to understand that if you love everyone and someone were to cut you off that you love, would you cast aspersions on them? No, you'd go, oh, they must be in a hurry today. I'll let them go. 
And it's a change of perspective so that you stop creating more karma, negative karma for yourself. It was explained to me um, one time that the amount of time it takes for your thoughts to become reality is the distance you are from your true self. Meaning if you're very clear and imbalanced and you think of something, it appears. I want a new car. Suddenly three days later, you get a phone call. Your best friend is moving to Europe. Got to get rid of his car. Doesn't know who to sell it to. Hey, do you want a great deal? Well, that's someone that's in balance. Now, someone who wants a new car and it takes them a year to find it, there's a lot of stuff piled up in between. And that's because our brains are constantly coming up with nonsense. We're constantly on the hamster wheel. I want a new car. Well, I can't afford it. Well, but I need a new car, but I can't, I don't know where to put it. And so we start and stop and start and start and stop and start. And we now have 50 different things that we're creating. If you simply streamlined and got rid of all of it and said, I'm going to create one thing at a time, you would start to see those things start to appear faster, quicker, and cleaner. But it's because we muddle it all. We say, all right, I want this. No, I don't. All right, no, I want, well, well, but, and that has to stop. The other big thing that I, I learned in these last near-death experiences has to do with how we manifest. I remember they came to me in one of these dying experiences and, and said, a lot of books are written about manifestation. Uh, you know, Jim Carrey was a, a good friend of mine. And the first time that we met and had lunch, he reached into his wallet and pulled out this check that he had written to himself for a million dollars. He said, when I was... 15 years old, I knew I was going to, someone was going to pay me a million dollars to make a movie. And it hadn't happened yet. This was just after he had made um, Ace Ventura. And we were working with him on a couple of other projects. I had indoctrinated myself with him. And yet only two movies later, he did get that million dollars. But in manifestation, we think, all right, I want a new car. So I'm going to manifest the money that buys the new car. I'm going to manifest a new job or I'm going to manifest extra hours or you just lost. Manifestation is you see yourself in the new car, period. You have no idea what gets you to that. And by doing that, you allow yourself a thousand opportunities. Because you haven't described how you get that new car, it can come from inheritance, it can come from winning the lottery, it can come from a million different ways. But if you're manifesting specifically by, I have to make the money to buy the car, you've eliminated 99% other opportunities to happen in the natural balance of things. And I thought that was incredible information. Um, on top of that, what they had showed me is that our thoughts actually have life force to them. So when you see yourself in the car, it's like they described it as a paint by numbers. You're painting in a little bit more of the picture. Every time you think of yourself in that new car, you paint in the ear of the picture. You paint in the nose of the picture until you've thought about it enough times. You've given it enough life force enough times that it comes into reality. Let me ask you this. What if you want a car and a house and a boat? Do you do one at a time or you can do all three? Do you just don't manifest you how can, you get You them? can do all three, right? And so you see yourself pulling up to your new house, in your new car, towing your new boat, right? The problem that we get into, and that's when we really start to, to go into this, is that there is a law of balance. And if you get too involved in materialism and you want too many things, that takes you out of being in balance. And so you will start to buck up against the laws of karma sometimes, which is another conundrum in, 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 in materializing things. You know, one of the greatest uh, people that ever talked about this was uh, a book written called The Game of Life and How to Play It um, by Florence Chauvel Shin, written in 1926. And so she would have all these affirmations she would teach people. And at the end of the affirmation, it would always be, and in the perfect way. 
right? I want a new car in the perfect way. So that she was trying to separate separate herself from creating negative karma. Because she didn't want to get a new car because someone had gotten an accident and gotten killed and she had gotten the money. So she was constantly defining the manifestation to try to stay within karma's view. I don't get, to, we start to get too much scientific into being, you know, something ethereal. So really it should just be your intuition. If your intuition says, I should have a new car, then it's easy to simply see yourself in it and allow it to happen. I mean, I can give you a hundred examples of how that happens. Um, for instance, we had lost our house in 2008 with the crash. All these incredible things happen to the point where we lost every single penny that we had, every car, every house, everything we lost that we had built our entire life, we lost in 2008. And that is when this first near-death dying experience happened to me. And when I went back to the elders and said, why did you take everything from me? They said, if you would have been in a position with all that materialism, you never would have accepted the rights that we asked you to take. Nor would you have appreciated in the proper way. You still would have held homage to that materialism. You had to have nothing left on your back. And then we offered you. And I said, okay, it's too late now. <laughs> You've taken everything. I mean, and it was a crazy amount of events, right? And we had this beautiful house up in North Scottsdale that we lost. We thought it was our dream home. Well, fast forward seven years later, we had to go rent a house for six years. Didn't have the money to buy a house. Six years later, oh, and the bank that foreclosed on us, they wouldn't let us get a new house because they refused to sell it to anybody. And you have to have the house sold for four years before you can get a new house. All these crazy things happen. So six years later, we decide it's time to buy a house. We have to get our house again. We have to get back on track. We start looking based on how much money we're making. We don't see anything. We look at 50 houses. There's nothing out there. In the mail, the next week after we start looking, Universal Studios sends my wife $10,000 from a lost retirement account that never, didn't even know that we had. They said, by the way, we found this. It's just sitting here. Here's a check for 10 grand. Suddenly we had half a down payment. Then the next day, my wife gets a phone call, gets a new job. Her salary is raised by $25,000. We can now afford a house a little bit more. We now have a down payment. So we start looking again. And the house that we're in right now the woman had it on the market for 14 days. And at the 15th day, she lowered the price by $125,000. She decided that day she wanted to sell it. And we never saw it before because it was out of our price range. It was never in our, our look. It suddenly came in our price range. We looked at it and got the house the next day. It's barely a half a mile from our old house. It's everything that we ever wanted. Again, you could never imagine those things happen. I would never say, look, I can buy a new house because someone's going to send me money from nowhere. Someone's going to lower the price of this incredible house by 100000 I could never imagine those things, which means I never could have attracted this house if I would have specified how I was going to get it. Do you think we'll ever evolve beyond karma? Yes. Well, I think that's exactly where we're going. I think that's exactly where we're going. But it's going to take um, some carnage for people to really get it. Um, and I think that the destruction of the planet is the thing that is actually going to start to awaken everyone. That's that's the way I see it. What do you mean by the destruction of the planet? Well, what I was taught is that the Earth is a living, breathing thing, just like us. Obviously, we are of the Earth. And when we get sick, what do we do? We start to get all this phlegm and we start to perspire. We try to bake and purge the illness out of us. Well, the earth, because of all of our pollution and nonsense, is incredibly sick right now. And so these storms, these weather systems, these thousand, just two days ago, there was a thousand year rivers, a thousand year storm in Dallas, nine inches in 24 hours. That is the earth cleansing herself trying to get back into balance because she's actually been 
misused by us. And it's going to get worse in the next 10 years. And that force of nature against us is the thing that will wake our consciousness up. Because when we realize we can't grow food anymore, we don't have water to drink, we don't have things to eat, we don't have air to breathe, we're going to make a change. And when we make the change to accept the consciousness of actually living together as a species, that is when karma goes away. And that's how we used to live. And that trails back to my original book, um, The Handbook. And they said that all the things that I wrote in that first book, because I went to them and said, look, you're teaching me all these secrets. Am I supposed to just go to the public with this book? It doesn't make any sense to me. They said, no, this book is the basic knowledge that everyone used to have six, 7,000 years ago. Everyone used to think in these terms. And this book will help reignite that memory in the rest of the population. We just have to remember how we used to think and how we used to understand each other and the planet and the universe. All right. We've mentioned the book, but you haven't given us the title yet. Uh, it's title? called The Handbook. It's called The Handbook? The Handbook. Um, and the you know the name that they had given me, which was Konawaka, K-O-N-A-H-W-A. K.A. Konawaka, that's the author that it's under. So there's many the handbooks. There's the handbook of science, the handbook of accounting, but it's the handbook by Konawaka. And they were spe very specific in terms of how they wanted me to write the book, as you know, word for word. They even gave me the design, the cover design, the titles, the preface, and they the size. They wanted it to be small so that you could actually put it in your pocket and take it with you. The way that they view ancient wisdom, especially in written form, is that it those are books that you read once, beginning to end. And then after that, anytime that you have an intuitive question, you simply open the book and wherever it opens to, that is the answer to the question that you ask. It's supposed to be a daily reference, if you need be, of any question you ever have any day. It will simply open up to that answer. Do you find it on Amazon or your website or both? Both. We have it on our, our website, which is uh, ancientnativeremedies.com, which is where we sell our medicine nationally on the internet. And then Amazon carries the handbook. And I, I wrote it. It's a trilogy. So the second book is called Indiscriminate Concepts. And then the third is More Indiscriminate Concepts. But you have to read them in order. Um, they sort of tell the story in, in an evolving way in terms of spiritual understanding. So the very first book, the handbook, is, is really what the, the masses you know, are trying to get. And of all the things they told me to do, that was the number one thing, was to write the book and give it out, plain and simple. That was my task, which I have sort of faltered at, I would say, in the last 11 years, partially because I didn't come out. I didn't explain to people what had happened to me and, and how this information happened. And it wasn't until I saw your program and others of people coming out with near-death experience where I went, oh, that's pretty crazy. Well, that doesn't make mine that crazy. I guess I could actually start telling people what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And the solace that I had, and it was just, this was just a month ago, and this is for 11 years I felt this way. The solace that I had of saying, you know, I can actually tell people what happened to me for the first time. And whether they think I'm crazy or not, it, it doesn't matter because it finally makes sense to me. Because it isn't, I didn't dream this up. I didn't just wake up and start making this up. And by being able to explain it happened because you crossed the veil. You know, when I wrote that in a blog recently, I said, look, when you're in a near-death experience, it's because you're closer to the other side than you've ever been. So it's easier to get information. It's easier to know the truth of many things, including your own life if you're that close to leaving the body and that far away from earth. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Should they do that through your website? Sure. You can do that um, through Ancient Native Remedies There's a, or our Foundation for Ancient Healing. Both of those have Gmail accounts, Ancient Native Remedies at Gmail or Foundation for Ancient Healing at Gmail. I had started a nonprofit trying to create these healing centers. Um, and sort of just backed off because, again, I was a little bit of the carriage before the horse. 
Um, I have to raise a little bit more funding to be able to start making centers around. Um, we have the main center up north, and we're just starting another one here in Phoenix. Um, but to be able to expand and start teaching other people how to grow medicine, how to make it for themselves, how to protect plants, um, that'll I'll probably start up again in another year or two as we start to sell more books and things like that, that to fund it. Do you have anything else that you're working on that you want us to know about? I do. You know, I started a blog um, because I started to take my personal experiences and connect them to the teachings that the ancients had given me. Um, for instance, the story I told you um, before we came on air where I had a past life experience of being a producer in Hollywood before, which is what made it so much easier to become a Hollywood executive this time in this lifetime. I start to pair up my own personal experiences with the teachings um, in this blog so that people can understand how it parlays. Because I think what happens is you read some of these spiritual books or even you go on and you see people talk in spiritual terms and it's a very abstract, it doesn't mean anything. You know, it's like when we talked about me getting the house that we're in, until you put it in practical terms of, I only visualized the house, I didn't visualize how it was going to happen, and then these things happened. So being able to put my personal experiences together with the teachings in this blog, I think is really an incredible thing. It's the other thing I'd like to share with people, but I blew up a computer in writing it again, which typically um, tells me that um, maybe the information is not ready yet. I know that sounds crazy, but it happened to me when I was writing um, the second book. Uh, I wrote a chapter called Family Affair. And there's uh, a teaching the ancients gave me about families and that the first 18 years of a child's life, they work off the karma of their previous incarnation. And then at 19, they move into simply the purpose of this incarnation. They go and they clean up their sandbox so that they can start a new design, basically. Well, what that translates to in modern society, though, is that parents should, like lions do to their cubs, they should kick their kids out at 18. They should let them go. This idea that we have to stay together as a family unit is actually not a proper concept. You have parents karmically that help you as a child, that help you work off your previous karma, but they're not there to help you in your new incarnation. They're just there to help you in the cleanup. So that's why you have all these people with relationships with their parents when they're adults and their parents keep treating them like children. That's their karmic connection. And so you many times actually have to break from your parents to truly find your new direction in this purpose, in this lifetime, because they will just try to hold you in those old ideas. And it's nobody's, it's not a fault. That's just the way karma had set it up. Anyways, when I wrote it and, and put it, tried to put it in the book, I burned the computer just completely right. And the dream that I had a couple of nights later was, you can't release that yet, sorry. So I took it out of the book, was able to recover everything except for that chapter. And then I put something else in and, and released the second book. So uh, the reason I bring it up is maybe the blogs aren't quite ready yet because I, I blew up a computer again um, in writing the blogs. So, But there are four or five articles I started with that would really be helpful as I talked about. I talk about the first time um, I talked to the dead and, and had uh, experiences like this and going to the center as a kid, things like that, and talking about astral projection and a little bit of manifestation. Have you noticed that after any of your NDEs that you had cognitive changes that could be considered you have new psychic abilities? Yes. <laughs> um, and the way to describe this is really interesting. I have always felt like, and I'm sure you have this too, where you have a sense of people, right? You, within a couple of minutes of talking to them, you know if they're full of shit or not, right? you get a sense in your solar plexus of who they are and, and what they mean. And I had developed that to the point where I actually had a sense that I could feel where illnesses were in other people. That was just sort of kind of what it is. After that first near-death experience, and then after the fourth, a couple of years later, I now, when people stand in front of me, 
I can see their past lives. I have a sense of what their past lives were, what their connection is. And I now have a sense of why people are here in their incarnation and what they're supposed to do. In other words, I'm able to see their own understanding. I'm able to communicate to their soul. And I could never do that before. I can have someone, if you give me a name, I can actually call them forward and speak to them on a soul level and understand what's going on. Um, and, and how that translates, it goes back to that idea that we talked about when we talk about someone with 50 past lives and then they incarnate with only four of them. Well, when you talk to somebody in person, they're coming from that four-person perspective. When you talk to them on the ethereal, on the soul level, you're talking to the 50 lifetime person. So you can talk to them in person and they'll shake their head and say, I don't know what you're talking about. You can talk to them on a soul level and they'll go, yep, that's exactly right. That's what I'm thinking. And that's what comes down to, um, I think there's two. One is that the near-death experience made me certainly more psychically uh, created greater psychic abilities. I can see people, I can see their incarnations, I can talk to their soul. But also moving into that part of the galaxy that we talked about, I find that as a whole, we are all becoming much more intuitive. You know, I describe it in a way that 10 years ago, if someone stood in front of you and lied to you, you'd go, mm, I think they're lying. Now, when someone stands in front of you and lies to you, you actually start to feel sick. You, it, it's, it's a much stronger visceral reaction. And it's not, I think they're lying. You know. And that is those other planetary energies raising our consciousness. I think as a whole, we have shifted since 2012 as a society. And again, that's part of the confusion is people are going, yeah, but I, I don't want to feel those things. I don't want to get that information. I don't want to know they're lying. I want to pretend everything's okay. But yes, my, my work escalated sort of as, if you would say, if I worked as a medium, times 10, times 10, without a doubt. You know, I had gone to people like Sylvia Brown and John Edwards, and I had met all those types of famous mediums. They don't do work on that type of level. level. You know, the good people in like Long Island Medium, they're good people. She's not doing soul work. Yes, she helps heal people. She helps a deceased father that hasn't had a conversation with the daughter, right? That last conversation, incredible work. But we're not moving into why are you here? Why have you incarnated on earth at this moment? That's what they started to show me. When you describe the balloon, like with 50 of our previous art incarnations, like the soul, would you also consider that the higher self? Correct. It's exactly what it is. And, and then when we talk about, and that's an incredible, important, incredibly important point. When we talk about the voice in our head, when we talk about guides, or we have some master talking to us, no. The inner voice, the intuition voice, that is the 50 lifetime. That is our higher self just talking to our minimized lower self. So when I would have people come to me and say, well, you know, I, I have this guide and they tell me all the time. I'm like, no, you don't. That's you, your higher self. But the reason that it comes to you in snippets, the reason that it comes to you in little pieces at a time is because, again, your higher self knows not to get in the way of the karma, knows not the way to get in the way of the lesson. You know, they told me a few years ago that I couldn't really help people one-on-one -on -one as a consultant, as a healer, because the information that I was working on and getting was such that I would interrupt their lesson. Look, people take 10 years to get really sick. They don't listen themselves. They eat bad. They drink. They smoke. They stress. And suddenly they have this terminal disease. And you're going to come in and magically make it go away. All those lessons, all the things that they would learn from that dying experience, learn from that terminal illness, goes away. Well, that creates a karmic debt that the healer has to take on. This person has worked hard at creating the circumstance to teach the lessons that this illness is bringing them. And you're going to just make it go away? 
can't do it. You can't do it. I had a couple of, of surgeons come to me a few years ago for a consult. And they were, they were, both of them were abdominal surgeons. They were always doing gallbladders and things like that. Both of them started to get intestinal cancer. Both of them started to get sick with the things that they were healing. It just happens. So <clears throat> there was a, I do have one more I could share with you from father that I think is one of his greatest teachings. Um, okay. After about four months after the, the two near-death experiences with him, I was really despondent. I was still very sick. I had kind of published, the, I had put the book together, didn't know what to do with it. I wasn't making any money. My family was stressed. Everything was horrendous. It was just upside down. We had lost everything. And I sat in my room and I just started screaming for father. I said, look, come on. I, I don't know what I agreed to. I don't know what you made me say yes to, but I take it all back. I don't mean it. I don't want anything to do with this shit. I want nothing. I, I'm done. And sure enough, about two days later, he appeared. Only this time, it was like a hologram. It wasn't him in person like he had been before. It was just this kind of mere light faded image, right? Doesn't say anything. And I said, so? And the first thing out of his mouth is, David, I told you I could never come back again. And I said, yeah, but you're here. <laughs> and he said, what do you want? I said, I, I don't have it. I said, I don't want, I don't want to do this. I don't want to. And he just stared at me. N knowing that I can't renege, I could not come back from what I agreed to do. I said, okay, all right, let's put it this way. Everybody's going to come to me and say, you have all this information. You have all these teachings. How, how do I know that I'm doing the right thing? How do I know that I'm living my life properly? How do I know I'm on the path, as they say? I said, I don't have an answer for that. I said, I look for it in the book. I look for the things you've already taught me. I don't have an answer for that. I said, I, I, you have, and a little, like a little smile. I just kind of went on his face, right? And he turned around and he reached in, I didn't know he had a pocket, reached into his pocket and he dropped a pebble on the ground. And he took a step forward ahead of it. And then he just stood there with his back to me. And I looked down at the pebble. And I looked up at him. And I said, yeah, I get it. Great. The pebble story. Oh, you came all this way to teach me the pebble story. Fantastic. And he turned around and looked at me sternly again, only the second time. And then turned away again. And I was so despondent. I was just so irreverent. I was just like, oh, come on. This is such nonsense. The pebble. I know. Just follow the stone. Come on. He didn't budge. And I said, okay, fine. I get it. I'll play the game. And I went to reach for the pebble. And before I got to it, he reached in his pocket, dropped a second pebble, and took another step forward. And then he looked back to me and looked forward away again and i said again father come on i get it you know there'll be a pebble that will tell me the path i said that's nonsense it that doesn't do anything for me and he turned on me again and he was really he wasn't mad but he was just so intense and he said you missed the income you missed the entire point of the story i said what did i miss he said, you do not recognize that you simply reached towards that first pebble and a second pebble appeared. You didn't even pick the first pebble up. He said, all you have to do is when you have the intuition or the pebble that comes to you, the idea to do something, to call someone, to buy something, to sell something, whatever it is, you simply have to entertain the idea and a second pebble will appear to validate that that is what you should do i'll give you the for instance i had someone contact me years ago that was in trouble and she had this intuition that she was supposed to move to kansas city and she hates kansas city she's only been there a couple of times she had no idea why she had it 
And she said, and my whole life ever since then for the last six months has been shit. Everything's wrong. Everything's breaking apart. Everything's a mess. My job's going wrong. I said, well, that's the pebble, Kansas City. She said, I don't want to move to Kansas City. I said, you just have to move towards the pebble. You just have to entertain the idea of Kansas City. She said, well, how do I do that? I said, well, if you were going to move to Kansas City, what would you do next? She said, well, I'd start looking for housing and start applying for jobs in Kansas City. I said, there you go. She goes, but I don't want to move to Kansas City. I said, no, 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 no. Just start moving towards the pebble. She said, okay. So three weeks later, she calls me and four phone messages. You got to call me back. You got to call me back. You got to call me. So I called her back. I said, Sarah, what's going on? She said, well, I started looking for places in Kansas City, houses, housing. She said, and really, there was some nice stuff. I was really surprised. And it was kind of affordable. She said, so then I looked up a couple of places and I applied to a couple of jobs. And there was a great job, perfect for me. And I didn't get it. She said, so I abandoned it. I was so despondent. I was like, all that for nothing. She said, and 10 days later, I get a phone call from the company. And the recruiter says, look, you were up for this job in Kansas City. You were perfect for it. But we had somebody in-house that already lived here that would really fit in the job almost as well. But we have a better job for you. The problem is it's in San Francisco. And that's the place that she really wanted to move to. And they offered her the job and she moved to San Francisco. Now, the only way that she got to San Francisco was by way of Kansas City. And she didn't have to move to Kansas City. And she didn't have to commit to Kansas City. She simply had to move towards it. That's a great lesson. David, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? <laughs> There's so many. Um, you know, in the in that first book that I write, the handbook, um, there's a saying that it's in the third or fourth chapter, and it's uh, live, love, and grow. And um, in order to to live, you you have to love, and uh, in order to love, in order to grow, you have to love, and in order, it's this cycle of that you have to love for your life to be full. You have to love for your life to grow. And if you are not growing, you can't have permission to live. And it's this sort of this vicious circle. And not in a bad way, vicious as in wrong. But when we take that equation out, when we take out the idea of loving each other, the planet, and everything around us, everything stops. We stop growing. We stop having the reason for living. You know, even in the second chapter of the book, I write about the path and I talk about the labyrinth of life, of, you know, left and right and confusing and where do I go and how do I go? And they simply say that if you simply love the situation, if you put love towards the problem, it will elevate you above the labyrinth and you'll be able to see your way out. And that is the only way that answers and the completion of life can happen. David, thank you for that message, and thank you again for joining me. I really appreciate you, and I wish you the best. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara Podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.